Hey everyone, this next talk, uh, our next speaker is Arno, and Arno works in academia and now works at Twig. He has a long be he has long been interested about linear logic, linear typing, and computer aided proofs. And today he will talk about data versus control, a tale of two functors, and the distinction between these two words. So please welcome Arno, and Arno, feel free to start when you're ready. Thanks for the introduction and uh, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, so before we start, uh, I just want to make a point. Uh, I have a very, very precise plan for this talk. So don't hesitate to disrupt it. It's going to be much more fun this way. Uh, we're going to keep an eye on, on chat. So if you have any question, um, you know, clarification that you need, don't hesitate to ask them. Uh, I'll do my best to answer. Uh, to interrupt whatever I'm doing and change my plan. The worst that can happen is we don't get to the end of this talk and I think that's fine. Um, so uh, with all that said, uh, let's get started. Um, so there's this thing uh, in Haskell um, about like module hierarchies. Um, they're, sort of, they're sort of ordered in bins there's, uh, there's system and there's data and there's control and there's plenty others. And in one way, it is just an arbitrary way to sort, sort modules so that they appear neater. But for this to work, it needs to uh, appeal to a certain intuition that we have. But I think like, data and control in particular appeal to a very, very deep intuition in, um, in computer science and computer engineering in general. It goes back to the very inception of computer science, and at least as far as Alan Turing was in the Turing machines, there's these two things. There is the tape, which is a holder for data. It holds data, and there's, there's, uh, there is the state, and the state controls how data is written or re read or read, sorry. <laughs> Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons why these two categories have been made, uh, because we sort of relate to them in a certain sense. Uh, today I want to speak about these two categories, uh, about what they mean, um, and focusing on these uh, four modules that are currently on screen. Uh, if they're not on the screen, shout, it means that there's a bug somewhere. Uh, it looks fine on my end, but if there's a screen sharing issue, let me know. So, nobody's shouting. Looks good. Okay. Um, so, uh, so yeah, the four modules are functor, traversable, applicative, and monad. Um, so we're going to uh, have a quick look. Um, first, focusing on data a little. So data is kind of about, well, th at least these two modules, they're about data structures a thing that contains values. Um, so if a thing contains values, it makes sense that we can take these values and swap them out for something else. And that is the type of the fmap function. Um, traverse is a bit more tricky and I won't go into the detail, but it's a very, very powerful generalization of fmap. You can look at the type and say, eh, it kind of looks the same. There's this f in addition, that's a bit magical. Uh, it's extremely powerful. It also requires uh, the type to hold finitely many values. Um, and I left a, a, quote, a recent quote from Matt Parsons that uh, I think illustrates uh, the importance of Traverse quite a bit. Um, so examples of data things uh, like functors and traversables uh, are lists, are very typical. This is, uh, lists of A, it's a very typical, a prototypical example of uh, something that's traversable and say a map uh, from int to some something. Uh, this is a factor. In both cases, you can swap the elements out and you can count the element, et cetera, et cetera. And these are what uh, factor and traversable uh, give you. So it sort of makes them to tug them into the data. They talk about things that contain stuff. Eh, data, good. Um, and so on the other hand, end of this spectrum is control and control, control is not about control structures, though it's a word that exists, it's about things that 
to which control structure applies. It's a bit more abstract in this sense. A control, like the control hierarchy is also about control structures, but not these two modules I'm talking about. Um, sort of the, the, the main important thing about these is the do notation. Uh, the do notation lets us sequence things uh, it's, uh, and it requires something to be a monad. Uh, control that applicative, uh, applicative functors are a sort of a restricted version of monads where the control flow needs to be statically known. Um, other than that, yeah, these are things that represent somehow or that can have a control flow. Okay, so far so good. Um, so this is, uh, this is uh, what we're going to, going to talk about. And like right off the bat, there's something that is slightly bothering me and that has been bothering me since the very beginning of working with Haskell is that like applicatives are functor. So what's the deal? Do functors cease to be about data when they become applicative? <laughs> Don't know, that's kind of weird. And like, if you look a bit further, there's one example uh, that I didn't put in the control uh, slide uh, that is also very typical when we talk about monad, maybe it represents some, some kind of failures and we saw it in Joachim's uh, talk in the morning. Uh, it can represent like uh, an extended version of Boolean. Uh, IO is for like everything, it's the kitchen sink of monads. Uh, but there's another common one, which is list that represents backtracking. But now, this is one of the prototypical example, both of data and control. What's going on? That's kind of weird. Um, uh, so before we move on, uh, there's just one thing I want to add is that not only lists are both uh, data and control, they're also applicatives in two very, very different ways. So these are like a short, a slight simplifications of the definitions of applicative for list. And for zip list, which is just an alias for list, a new type for list um, in, um, in, in, in base. Uh, and so uh, basically uh, you can think of the, the applicative for list at the top as computing the Cartesian product of two lists. So if you have uh, an A somewhere and a B somewhere in the list, then somewhere in the output, there will be the pair A, B wherever they are, whereas zip lists, they just um, match, z match lists in a uh, lockstep, as the name implies, they're just called a zip. Two lists, two things. So the, uh, the, the, the list at the end has the same size as the original list, but that sort of begs the question, is data control or data really? Because whereas the, pr the first applicative is really sort of what backtracking needs, the second one is all to do with data that you can zip together. So should we move applicative to data? Is it, uh, so that's what we're going to talk about. But before that, <laughs> one last thing. Um, so um, this is a common uh, way of implementing Lambda Calculus. Um, so if you don't know what this is, just think just the backslash in, in the application in Haskell, and that's just it. It's the, the smallest possible calculus that looks a bit like Haskell. Um, and, and so basically what's happening in, in the abs case, we're adding a variable to the list of variable we're going to use. So lam a means a lambda term, a term that may mention variables of type a uh, as its free variables. And this is a monad. Uh, it's, it's a sort of a well-known uh, trick and, sorry. <laughs> um, and, the, uh, and the bind, the, the, fun, uh, the fundamental uh, monad thing just corresponds to substitution. Uh, you can sort of read it there, just replace all the variables, the A's, by a lambda term that has uh, different, possibly different variables. And that's, you could read it out of the type, it's substitution. So like, are monads about control or data really? That's kind of like, could, we could see that applicative was sort of on the edge, but 
monad. It's the most controlled things that we have, but really, it's not that clear. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so what's what, what's happening here? Um, should, should, should everything be data? Everything be controlled? What's happening? Uh, but before we move on, just one last thing. It's not that I want to uh, beat uh, this dead horse to the ground, though. I absolutely do. No, no, the, this is just a very interesting thing that I couldn't resist putting in my slides. Um, so you can define these two types, V2 and V3. So you can think of them as vectors of type 2 and vectors of type 3, or lists of a given size, or tuples that are homogeneous in their argument. And uh, both of these are Interestingly, both applicative and traversable. Uh, the applicative thing is about is, is a bit like zipless. You take two things and you match the corresponding fields, uh, two or three, depending on which one. And the traversable is just the normal traversable they can imagine. You apply the thing to the first to the first to the first element and then to the second element. And it turns out to be important, well, important, useful. <laughs> um, it's um, so you can, if you have vectors of type three and two, you can make a, a vector of type three, a vector of type two to represent three by two matrices. And if you apply sequence A, which is one of the uh, a derived uh, thing from applicative functors, uh, you get something that has the type of the transpose function. And as it happens, it is the transpose function, which I find very interesting. And it ties us back to like, traverse is always the answer as uh, was a few slides ago. Um, so it's all fun and games, but now we have things that are both applicative and traversable. So again, uh, the dif distinction between these two, uh, these two namespaces becomes very, very muddled and puzzling. And a few years ago, that is where I was at. That's that was my understanding. I said like these don't really make sense. And when you start looking about uh, looking at them a bit closely, they don't really make sense. That's what I thought. But things changed uh, because I since discovered that there's a real meaning that you can apply uh, to the data and control uh, hierarchies, and I and we can leverage that. Uh, the problem is that these two notions, these two meanings, are conflated in Haskell. They're impossible to observe. There's a big mess of things. It's the same thing. Uh, and so when we have things that are uh, just jumbled together and want to tell them apart, we need some kind of a prism. Uh, yeah, not that kind of prism. Uh, that kind of prism, yeah. Uh, so we need some kind of a prism to tell them apart. Um, and the prism that I'm going to use is uh, the tool that made me discover uh, this uh, distinction or maybe realize it. And it's linear types. It doesn't need to be that. There's plenty of ways. Uh, we will so we'll see at the end of the talk, if we get there, uh, some of the more general uh, framework where we can think these things. Uh, but for now, here is one, and one that is coming in the next version of GHC. So we will be able to, uh, you will soon be able to play with it. So uh, besides being a nice toy, uh, it's like it's a fairly concrete one. Um, so my goal today is not really to uh, explain what linear types are good for. They are just a means to an end. So we're just going to assume that they're useful. Uh, and we're just going to look at what they mean. <laughs> Uh, and um, so linear types just introduce a new type of functions. It is more restricted than normal function. They're written with this lollipop arrow that you can see on the, on the slides. And uh, the a function that is A linear arrow B just means that it uses the X, which is of type A, like exactly once in a sense that uh, can be made precise. But today, I'm just going to show. I'm just going to show um, uh, to, to show by example and try to give you a sense of what linear types are by example. But the most easy of the possible linear function is identity. It takes an x, returns the x, doesn't do anything with it. It's very linear. And the most common nonlinear function is sort of a diagonal function. It takes an x, 
Uh, sorry. Uh, that was funny. Someone asked what lollipops they should go to in chat uh, for anybody watching on YouTube. Uh, um, so the, the function takes an X, returns two copy of the X, shares this X twice. And that is very, very much not legal in linear types. It's exactly once. So here is another linear function. Uh, by the way, uh, prepare your Twitch chat because the talk is going to get a bit interactive in a second. Um, so uh, swap uh, is linear in its first argument because it decomposes it, gets two components of it, and use these both, both of these components exactly once. In that case, we're just reordering them. Uh, so it's okay to decompose partially and just manipulate the rest linearly. Uh, and another nonlinear thing that is sometimes omitted uh, or forgotten is, <laughs> funny, forget, because uh, that doesn't use the X at all. That is also not allowed. Um, so let's, let's look at more examples of functions and let's, and I'm gonna ask a chat what they think. Is it linear or not? Is this function linear? Everybody says yes. No, yes. Yeah, it is linear. Uh, it decomposes the thing and uses the, uh, the field uh, inside exactly once. <laughs> um, so what about this one, linear or not linear? No. Linear. Yeah, it is the same function, really. It is linear. Uh, this one. What about this one? Is it linear? In X? Ah, this one has people a bit more. Uh, but yeah, linear is winning, and it is linear. We see X twice, but uh, we. It, I mean, there's a control flow split. There's a flow split. Like we can take only one branch. So which have a branch we take at the end, we will have used X exactly once. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, linearity is not a textual property of the text. That's really how the X is used eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, that is linear. Okay, this one. Oops. Uh, is it linear? No, 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 not linear, fantastic. It isn't linear, great, okay. Uh, that was the last one on that slide. Let me uh, pull this for a second more. Yeah, indeed, this, this is not linear uh, because uh, in the false case, we would not consume X. So in a sense, K of X and false would be equivalent to forget, which the function we saw was not linear. Exactly, fantastic. Uh, everyone gets it. Uh, more functions. Uh, is this one linear uh, with the dupe uh, function from earlier? No, it's not like Ross. It's exactly once. Um, uh, no, this is not linear. Again, we have a single X, but it is passed to a function that is not linear. It is not linear. Is this one linear with the identity from the first slide? Again, linear in X. Someone asked why exactly once. Uh, it's not the purpose of this talk, but we can talk about that during the Q&A, if you wish. Uh, yes, it is linear. Um, so id x is a, a linear use of x, and it's also called by id, so it's just like it, linearity propagates. At the end of the day, we use x exactly once. What about this one? That's a bit harder, because I haven't really explained about this. So here we have h takes the function u as an argument. It's using this linearly. Yes, yes, linear. Yes, 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 indeed, it's linear. Uh, so the call of a function is what makes it linear. Uh, you call, uh, when you call a function uh, once, it, it's a linear use of that function. So correspondingly, is this linear? Uh, 
uh, could be recursive. Uh, the, the function itself, u, doesn't need to be linear. It might or might not be. The point is the use of the function is linear. Um, um, uh, and that last function seems to have people divided. Yeah, no, it's not linear. Uh, it uses u several times, uh, and that is just not legal. Okay, so now we kind of know uh, what what uh, what linear types are about. Well, what they how they, they work. Arno, sorry. Yes, I have a question. Uh, will uh, the last one be linear if u was linear? No. Like the identity example. No, it's uh, it's the usage of u that is not linear. So it, it doesn't matter whether you use a linear function or not. Uh, we are not using u linearly. Um, but hold that okay, thought. It's going to maybe co co become clearer a bit uh, later. Okay. Um, continuing. Uh, so <laughs> a harder function is a recursive function. It's map. So uh, the map from list. Uh, so let's assume for a second that uh, yes, linear is can only be used once during execution. And I like fully consumed a certain way during execution. Uh, so map, and let's assume that F is a linear function from now. And now we have to sort of decide uh, whether it's linear in its first and second argument. Um, so we're going to work through this. Um, so the function, uh, so for, for first is, let's look at F and let's look at whether it's used linearly. So F, uh, it's called zero times in the first branch. So it already can't be linear. It's called several times in the second branch. So yeah, definitely F is not linear. So we can do this. Oh, ah, uh, well, I'd spoil the phone. My animation was screwed up. Uh, the point then was that was to go through the fact that this, the second argument, the list is indeed linear. Uh, and the first time we decompose it, which is always legal. Um, Uh, linear functions can be optimized to be in place mutations, thus reducing the need for GC, but not all functions are linear, so no GC should stay in general for all linear functions. Uh, okay, uh, another question for Q&A, but uh, it's not completely true that you can optimize linear functions uh, to use in-place mutation, but you can leverage linear functions for in-place mutation API, uh, which we've done. Um, so, and in the, in, the, in the second step, then we use X's once, X once and X's, well, if map is already linear by induction, then it is actually a linear use of X's. That's fantastic. So that's the type of map. Uh, it uses, uh, it ha with a linear function in the head, it takes it, it, takes it an, an arbitrary number of time, and then it takes a linear quantity of a list A and returns a list B. Fantastic. Um, so because, uh, oops, what happened? I think I just skipped something. My, my space bar is weird or something. Anyway, uh, functor. Uh, what is my point with functor? Oh yeah, functor, the, the f map type is just a generalization of the type for map for list. So because we know that, then we have, uh, we already have a type for functors. Uh, so this is the type of functors in the word of linear types. Um, Yes, if a function takes two arguments, it can be linear on one and not the second, which is the case of our map and map function. But here it's linear on the second and not the first one. Um, okay. Um, okay. Uh, I want you to focus for uh, a second there. It's uh, really uh, uh, the most important slide. Uh, and I think that it was, yeah, it was supposed to, I think I will stop using my space bar. Um, um, so this, this is a slightly different thing that we haven't seen yet. Here, X is swallowed up by a closure, uh, lambda I to I paired X, and then it passed to dub, which is a non-linear function. So as was obvious a second ago, uh, because it was on the slide, 
uh, this is not a linear function. And you can kind of see why, because then it's duplicated. And then if you find one i, maybe i is an integer, so you pass zero to both of these, then you get two x's and you've aliased x anyway. So it really shouldn't be. Uh, is linearity helping to show functor laws? No, no, it, it doesn't. Uh, they're already, functors alone are pretty simple already, because usually you get them by sheer parametricity. Um, the, uh, but it might help for traversable because uh, traversable are sort of linear by a sense. Uh, so longer question. Let's keep that on the side. Um, so uh, yeah, so you, it, like, and so the, the sort of the, of course, if if you, I should not use this. Uh, if you pass uh, the, the 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 closure to to a linear position, then it's of course linear. The point and the mantra that I want you to remember is that only a linearly consumed closure can have free linear variables. I'm going to repeat it just to make sure that everybody understands and remembers. That is the most important slide in the entire talk. If you remember one thing from this talk, it's slide number 20 here that we're watching. So only a linearly consumed closure can have linear free variables. Um, and so that's sort of a guide for linear variables. They cannot be captured in a closure that's not going to be used linearly. Uh, so let's look at the denotation, because I want to go back to the, we, we have the sort of functor bit uh, done, so I want to look at the monads a bit. Um, so, yeah, so that's the denotation. We can disagree it to something uh, that uh, is more concrete for us. Okay, so that is a very typical sort like shape of programs with monads. So now let's look at uh, possible types for bind. So one type we can think about like for sort of immediately is put all the arrows to be linear. Uh, and that works. Uh, I won't explain why, just trust me for that. It just works. You can, you can work through that at home if you wish. Uh, another possible thing is to take the first arrow to the left and make it nonlinear, but that doesn't work because now x is a linear variable by uh, as per the type of the uh, of the second argument, uh, but it is used it captures to the left of bind in several places, and y is so, and all of these uses are nonlinear. They're captured by nonlinear closures, and that's be bad. So we can't have this type, otherwise no do notation. Now we could also have the last arrow to be nonlinear, but then we have variables that appear to the, that are captured by closures to the right of a, of a bind and therefore are used nonlinearly. So that's illegal again, and that wouldn't type check. So we can't have this either. Um, so that leaves us like, except if we want to, if we don't want to have the middle arrow to be linear, but we kind of want uh, for the sake, because otherwise we don't, we can't take, we can't, blah, 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 we can't speak about linear things inside the monad. Uh, then we absolutely need that first type. So the type of monad is now decided. That's how it is. I uh, say so monad, everything is linear. I didn't talk about return, but it, like, trust me that it needs to be linear as well. Uh, one way you can think about that, if you couldn't do bind with as the second argument being a return if it wasn't linear. So that would be a bit weird. Um, but that raises an interesting issue is that you may know if you're familiar with this sort of things that we can define fmap in terms of bind. And if we do that, like the canonical way, it's exactly how you would write it in a normal Haskell with the normal arrows, no fancy lollipop arrow. No, no, that's the normal way. But if you take this type using the, the type that I wrote ab above, then suddenly all the fmaps, all the arrows of fmap are lollipops. Oh, that's different. Um, so we got a bit of a choice. Either 
will have the functor on the top that is like has one non in your arrow that works for list and and all the one at the bottom that seems to flow from the monad example and that doesn't work for list um so which is it which is the right functors with the right functor with linear types that's yeah you know, that's a, a, a bit of a puzzle but that's where the insight is the insight is that both are the right functor for linear types we actually need the two kinds and both are important and useful and show up in uh, actual code uh so uh because uh, the first functor is about things like listing that contain values and like values can be swapped and the second functor pertains to things that are like the uh like monads and support the do notation then we decided when we wrote the the, the linear base library to refer to uh, the first kind of as data functor and the second kind as control functor. Um, yeah, okay, there's a typo. The T in the second definition should be an M. Uh, thanks. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's very, very hard to write uh, 50 slides writing a typo. If it's the first one at slides 24, it's already quite brilliant. Um, are there obvious performance benefits from using linear types? No, they ca there can be. Uh, <laughs> there can be if you, if you use them right, but it, not, in, not, not inherently. Uh, Q&A question. Okay, uh, so that's how we call them. We refer to them as data functor and control functor. And so they kind of map to these two hierarchies. Um, and a couple of things that I want to stress is like all control functors are data functors, but everything in the left column, every example in the left column here on this slide is uh, actually a, um, is actually not a control functor. Uh, so it's, an, it's an inclu a, a strict inclusion. And uh, another thing I want to say is that this classification is specific to linear types. You could have all the prisms, as I said before, that have their own notion of control and data. All you need to, to all you need for this prism is to for it to be some kind of arrow, like the normal arrow or the lollipop arrow. If you had a fine arrow, if you know what that means, uh, then you would have uh, you could you could also write these two types, replacing the lolly by the affine arrow, and things would be a bit different. Like typically maybe would be a control, uh, a control factor, whereas for linear types, it's only a, a data structure. Um, is there an inheritance relationship in the library? I think we decided to have this inheritance. Yes, the uh, data factor being a, a super class of control factor. Um, so, um, so these are examples. Some of them we have seen already, and uh, and like and, and I didn't put I/O, but we can have I/O as a control functor, of course, and state writer and reader. All these things you can see that uh, for linear for linear types, they kind of have this specific thing as being a single value as wrapped in an effect. So it's an effect that computes a value. So they look a lot for linear types as uh, imperative programming language would look like. Um, so everything has a re has one written value all the time. Um, and, and this sort of continues. There's a data and a data functor and a data uh, and a control functor. There's a data applicative and a control applicative. If you look closely at the slides, they only differ by the type of pure. Um, and you see that uh, it, sort of the idea is that um, in, in data applicative, uh, so the base, the basic uh, a structure uh, ha can have a diagonal that can have more than one of a, a value which sort of makes sense. It's a store, uh, it's a store of value. And data applicatives means like zip list earlier, things that can be zipped. So zip list is not a data applicative. Uh, and that would be because, um, 
because uh, that would not be a total operation. We can't really do anything uh, with the leftovers uh, when we get to the end of one list. But if you have a list of a given size, like V2 and V3, then suddenly, yes, yes, it is. Uh, you can zip them linearly without any issue. Um, lists are not applicative either because, uh, uh, because uh, Cartesian product is not linear. But that's pretty much it. Um, and so, as usual, control applicative will be a static control flow, uh, like normal, uh, like norm, like when when you think about applicatives when you, when you use them uh, with the, together with the do notation. Control flow that cannot depend on the result of a previous operation. Uh, I'm, I'm getting lost in chat. <laughs> uh, it can actually continue that to monad, though. Of course, we're gonna guess that because um, uh, previously we saw uh, that lamb with, with substitution uh, was a monad and then that corresponds to data monad. Of course, data monad, uh, because of the weird type, which I got uh, right, yes, um, uh, because of the weird type cannot, like doesn't support do notation because it cannot capture variable uh, downstream, um, but you can still do substitution. So here list reappears, uh, which uh, gives us an interesting thing that data monad uh, is, are not a subclass of data applicative, whereas control monad are a subclass of control applicative, uh, which is interesting. Um, uh, so yeah, and also another funny thing is that uh, whereas applicative in the previous slide uh, differed only by the type of pure and one arrow there, these one have the same return, but they have a different type for uh, bind. Uh, there is no data monad in the linear based library, by the way, uh, because they're, they're not really generally applicable. They're sometimes useful, uh, but uh, I, I, we haven't like gone around to, to deal with them or think about what they should be. Uh, so maybe they will never be there. I don't know. Um, before we move on uh, to uh, closing remarks, um, I have uh, this confession to make is that things don't always work out exactly. Um, uh, because uh, like comprehension um, it's something that we think of very data driven, like we can define lists that way. And uh, it's, just a, it's a fairly normal way to define lists. And that looks like it's about data structures. It's about storing values. But the denotation is exactly the, sorry, the compre comprehension is exactly the same thing as the denotation up to trivial details that I don't want to get in, but it's, it's equivalent. Um, so it's just a syntactic reformulation of the denotation. So that expression I wrote is exactly the one that we wrote before when we had an example of the denotation. Uh, so is comprehension control? No, obvious, obviously not. So this is uh, this division between data and control has its limits and doesn't necessarily work for everything. But it's still a fairly suggestive name to use uh, to mean these two different kinds of functors, applicatives and monads. And again, uh, because the classification is not strict, like some things navigate between control and applicative, uh, sorry, control and data, depending on what is my arrow, normal arrow, lollipop arrow, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, okay, the questions about linearity and exceptions are also good Q&A questions, if you wish. Uh, okay, um, so I promised a sort of a general framework and I'm actually a bit earlier than I thought I would be, so that's great. Uh, we're getting through this. Uh, this person is called Eugene Moji. Uh, you might have heard of him and know him as the person who introduced monads in programming. Uh, if you have, that's wrong. So sorry about that. 
That would be Phil Wadler, who's giving tomorrow's keynote, by the way. Uh, you should probably watch it. It's going to be great. Uh, Moji introduced the idea of using monads uh, for the semantics of programming language, not for programming itself. Um, so why am I talking about Moji? Uh, I am because like Moji already knew about all this somehow. Um, just took me, I guess, a long time before I realized uh, that. Um, because Moji, in his uh, paper about using monads for notions of computations, uh, was not actually talking about monads, really, more about strong monads, which are monads equipped with something called a tensor, a tensorial strength. Um, so because so I'm, I'm going to focus on the functor for a second, because tensorial strength has nothing to do with monad, something that is both strong and a monad is a strong monad. Okay. So let's spend a minute to talk about this. Um, uh, so, right. So we're doing a bit of category theory there. If you're lost, it doesn't matter. Uh, there's going to be very, very short a foray into advanced category theory. This one is not very advanced, but it's going to be a hard very soon. Um, so you can think of that as something in, in Haskell. Um, so this a natural transformation such as this on a functor, an endo functor F on screen is called a tensorial strength. It looks a bit baroque, but uh, it is not, it's not absurd. Actually, you might have noticed uh, uh, the, uh, the light motif of this talk is uh, closures capturing variables. That's what was very important for the do notation. Having a strength means I can capture variables inside the closures I'm interested in. Um, so something like this you could write in Haskell. That, that is a way to define strength in Haskell, um, which you can define for every functor. And that's sort of where the story becomes interesting. Uh, and you might notice that in order to define this, it's very natural. You need to capture A inside this closure. Fascinating, isn't it? Uh, so we're going to see how the ability to capture free variables gives us strength. And because I'm a meanie, I haven't showed the converse on, on the slides, but you can take that at home as an exercise. If you have the function stra, you can emulate capturing variables and closures inside FMAP. It's a bit harder to, 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 uh, to express formally, but I promise you, you can. So strength is exactly what we need for the do notation to work. Um, so st strong functors, applicative and monads <laughs> uh, are about the do notation somehow. They're, they're, the requirement for the do notation is for a monad to be strong. Uh, so control, I got lost in, in the middle of my sentence, so control these are really strong these from a categorical point of view. So what is, um, oh yeah, before I move on, the reason why we don't think about that all that much uh, is that in Hask, all functors are strong. And, um, and if, um, and because of this, like everything is controlled, so to speak. So there is no way, as I say in the beginning, to teleport 
data functors and control functors. They are the same thing. Everything is controlled, including lists, including whatever you want. Zip lists are controlled as well, though the denotation doesn't make a ton of sense for them. It doesn't make sense, but you can use it. Same for LAM, uh, like any, any, any term-based language, it's fine. Um, so that is, that is a theorem. This is math. I can go into details in the Q and A if you want. But so what I want to uh, say as my final thoughts is what is, uh, what is the connection between strong functors and the types that we saw, because that is not obvious. And this connection is, uh, is, is due to something called enriched category theory. Uh, where categories are generalized a bit um, so that uh, home sets are taken to be objects in another category. It's not something I can explain in 10 seconds, so I won't even try. However, uh, this is all about symmetric monoidal closed category, which are enriched in themselves, like Hask and Lin Hask. What matters is that in this particular setting, then enriched functors and strong functors are the same thing. And the types that we saw are the types of enriched functors and functors that are not actually enriched or uh, more uh, uh, like, uh, sorry, I got lost and it doesn't matter. So that's the general idea. Strong and rich control all the same thing. Data, not necessarily strong, not necessarily enriched, all the same thing. Okay, that is the end for me. Here are a few links, including links to these slides. You can use the QR code there uh, to get directly to these slides. There's the linear base uh, library that I've talked about and a blog post I wrote on this subject to see a slightly different perspective on data and control, but like it's mostly the same idea. Um, great, that's all for me. Uh, thanks for playing along.